Thessalonians. We've been doing this study in the book of letter of 1 Thessalonians. And just as a reminder, this is a letter that Paul sent to the church in Thessalonica, which was in Macedonia. And if you recall, uh, Paul was led there by the Holy Spirit. Paul was planning his trip and working it out, had plans to go someplace else. Uh, but the Holy Spirit told him, no, you're going to go to Macedonia, where he first went to Philippi. And, of course, we get the story of the Philippian jailer of Lydia and starting a church there in Philippi under great persecution. And then he came to Thessalonica, where, again, a church was started under great persecution. And as Paul left Thessalonica and went to Athens and then down to Corinth, when he gets to Corinth, he writes a letter back to Thessalonica because he's concerned about them. I would be too. It's a brand new church, a lot of new Christians, and they're under all this persecution from the Jews in that city, plus uh, from those of other religions in the city, and there were many. And uh, they're under quite a bit of persecution. And he writes this letter, first of all, to tell them you're doing a great job. You guys are doing a wonderful job. Your love for one another, your testimony is being heard not just in Macedonia, but in Achaia, and even down to Jerusalem. They're hearing about your faithfulness. Great job. But he reminds them that even in persecution, we should still seek more. More love for one another. More sanctification. More separation from this world. You can't just sit there and say, well, I'm under persecution, so I don't have to work on any of that other stuff. Uh, Even in persecution, God is faithful, isn't he? He will not only protect us and get us through, but he will allow us to even grow in times of persecution. He tells them that, and which led to last week's conversation. In fact, let's go to chapter 4, verse 13, as a run-up to today. Because it reminds them that it will be worth it all. We're just saying that. That the persecution they're going through, the struggles they're going through, uh, the sacrifices they're having to make for one another, sacrifices for their family, sacrifices in their life. It will be worth it all. It is worth still growing. It is still worth loving one another. It is still worth spreading the gospel. It is worth it all. Why? Look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died. Even some, as he's writing this, he knows they have died under persecution. They have been martyrs. And When you see that and you're a young Christian and you're a young church, you're going, wait a minute, is this really worth it? He says, yes, that you sorrow not even as others which have no, what? Hope. We do sorrow when we lose a brother or sister. We do sorrow knowing that they're no longer with us, but we know where they're at, don't we? And we don't sorrow like the world sorrows because they have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them, those who have died in Christ, also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And this is the authority, isn't it? This is the word of God. This isn't something he's just making up to make everybody feel good. This is the word of God. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There is hope, isn't there? Because God is victorious over the grave. And all those who put their faith in him will rise, and not rise in this broken down sinful body, but rise glorified and will be with him. Then, verse 17, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It will be worth it all. Victory is at the end. Now, I want you to notice in there a couple of times he said, we which are alive. He's hoping who's in that list. He's hoping he is. <laughs> but was Paul? Can we have hope that we will be alive when Jesus Christ comes again? But is there, that's great, but is there any guarantee? And that's what he says today. Because if you're reading this, what's your thought? So when's that happening again? (laughs) How much longer must I go through this life? How much longer must I suffer through this life? How much longer am I going to have to deal with this persecution and these sorrows and these pains? How much longer? When? When is this going to happen? And that's where we get to chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. 
For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay? So he says, I have no reason to sit here and argue with you about seasons and signs, and if this is the time. And we do. We spend some time on that, don't we? We as Christians often get in those arguments and those discussions. And I don't know, how many, were, uh, how many of you were lived back in the 80s? Let's see, there's a few of you, a few of us. That was, that was a big business, wasn't it? I mean, you know, hey, Hal Lindsey and, you know, the beast is coming. Let me show you who he is. And, you know, oh, all the stuff going in the Middle East, all that. This is it. We're all going. Did we go anywhere? Did we miss something? I didn't miss anything. <laughs> no. Um, should we spend a lot of time figuring out if he's coming now? No, we know he's coming soon. And he's coming in the right time. In fact, it's when the world is saying peace and safety. They think they've got it all figured out. That's when he's coming. In fact, the reality is the when doesn't matter. It is the fact that he is coming. He is coming. In fact, keep something in 1 Thessalonians because we're obviously coming back. But let's go over to 2 Peter chapter 3. And as always, Peter seems to hit on the same topics, because <laughs> these are the po topics of the day. When is Jesus coming? And when you're under persecution, that's where your mind goes, doesn't it? When things in the world are being a mess, when it's, when it's just a disaster out there, your mind automatically goes, this must be the time, right? Well, no, not necessarily. Or maybe yes, I don't know. It could be, you guys wait, ready for it? It may be right now. That didn't happen. Could have. <laughs> but 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. The world sit here and sit, sits here and says what? The world says, where is the promise of his coming? How long has it been since Jesus looked his disciples in the face and said, be ready, I'm coming? It's been a long time. It's been a long time. We're coming up on 2,000 years. And what does the world say? Well, he hasn't come yet, so he's not coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, since our fathers passed away, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now that's just a flat out lie. Who would perpetuate such a lie? That nothing in this world has changed since the creation. Has something changed? It used to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we have the sin of Adam and Eve. It's different. We have the flood. It's different. Mankind and sin, things have changed. God has sent his wrath. God has sent down plagues and disasters and floods and things onto people, right? Things haven't, but they in their mind say, ah, it all just goes on as it does before. Verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Talking about what? The flood. It did happen. This is always amazing to me. Uh, you guys understand the current argument out there regarding the flood? It said all these other civilizations, early civilizations, have stories about the flood, so it must be a lie. Just one person created a story and they all the rest of it took. Let me ask you something. If all the ancient civilizations have a story of a flood, what's more likely? Something happened. <laughs> so there's evidence. So they want to be ignorant, willfully ignorant, willfully ignorant of God's judgment, willfully ignorant of God's hand in this world. Not only his salvation through Jesus Christ and his love for us, but also his wrath. They are willfully ignorant of it. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, which is just to say what? It's not an actual equation. Okay, <laughs> one day is a thousand, no. It just means what? Time doesn't matter to God. Soon is when? Now or 50,000 years ago, because he's been around how long? Well, you've been around forever. <laughs> then it's, it doesn't mean, but, verse 9, don't miss this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Will he keep his promise? 
How many believe God will keep his promise to save us from our sins? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. If he keeps that promise, will he also keep his promise to judge this world? Yes, he will. We've got to know both, don't we? He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. He is patient to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I know we look at it and say, how long, Lord? Why are you delaying? Why aren't you doing something about this? See how terrible this world is? You know how God looks at it? Every day somebody gets saved. Every day hundreds of people get saved. you realize that? And each day he waits, another hundred people get into heaven. And if we're doing a job, maybe it's thousands every day. If we're doing our job, maybe it's ten thousands every day. That should be our focus, shouldn't it? We should look at his patience as something positive for an opportunity for lost souls to not be lost for eternity. And that's what he says. But, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come. (laughs) He's not going to delay forever. And it will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. He's not bringing a flood next time. He's bringing what? Fire. Fiery judgment upon this world. And it will happen. And that's not what we mean by global warming. That's a whole different thing. (laughs) So we need to know what? When? We don't know exactly when, but do we know it's coming? And even though the world says, nah, it's not coming, that's a great bit of logic, isn't it? If something has never happened, that means it can never happen. Is that the way logic works? No. (laughs) Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not coming. In fact, he promised, and he always keeps his promise. So we, he's telling them, hey, guys, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year. It may not be in your lifetime, but it is coming, and it will be worth it, won't it? And whether you're dead or alive at that time, it will be worth it everything you went through. In fact, let's look at chapter 5, verse 4. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. While the world is ignorant, willfully, while the world sits there and says it'll never happen, while it will keep them, it will come upon them like a thief in the night, unawares. What about us? Should it sneak up on us? Should it surprise us? Again, we don't know when, but when it happens, should we be sitting there saying, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. We should be ready for that day, shouldn't we? Looking forward to that day. In fact, that's what he says in chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We know the truth, right? We know God always keeps his promise. We know he said he's coming again. We know we will be caught up. So therefore, we should be ready for that day, shouldn't we? In fact, let's look at a couple of passages where Jesus is speaking. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Keep something in 1 Thessalonians. Let's go to Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. He says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Now that's not literal, okay? We don't have to be sitting at home every moment of every day, robed and ready to go with our lights on, okay? But spiritually, should we be prepared to go? Ready to go. Lights burning, lights on because we are awake, right? And ready. In fact, look what he says in verse 36. And you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. That's an amazing statement. If they're ready, he will come and serve them. And that's just an amazing thought. That they'll, now he's writing to people during the time, does any Lord at that time serve their servants? No. But isn't that what God does for us? He will give us salvation. He will come and he will do what we need 
Verse 38. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, or find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But you, be you therefore ready also, for the Son of Man comes at an hour when you think not. Okay. So when must we be ready? All times. The good man in the house knew what time, that'd be easy. If Jesus, let's face it, a lot of people always ask, well, why didn't he just tell us? He actually told them about the time that he was going to come the first time, right? If you look through Daniel and the prophecies and things like that, you knew you had a good idea when he was coming. And it was announced to Mary, right? You knew nine months before he got there, he was coming. <laughs> you knew through John that he was coming as, a, as an adult. He was going to be there. He was going to start his ministry. We knew all of that. Is it going to be that way this time? And by the way, why not? Because let's face it, we're human. How many humans we got here today? You all call it humans? If God told us that I am coming May 14th, 2080, what would people be doing? What would all the people have been doing for the past couple of centuries? They wouldn't have been doing nothing. Because <laughs> he ain't what? Ain't coming yet. <laughs> I'm going to wait to 2029. 2079, February, March, I can start getting ready, and then I know he'll come. He knows us. But if he says, I'm coming, and you don't know what, and I'll expect you to be ready, when does he expect us to be out there working? When does he expect us out there telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ? When does he expect us out there ministering to one another, loving one another, and encouraging one another? He expects it all the time, right? Which is what he deserves. So we need to be ready at all times, don't we? So that when he comes, we are ready to immediately open the door and let him in. And he will then serve us. And we need to be ready for that day. In fact, look at Matthew 24. Part of the Olivet Discourse about the second coming. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 32. We need to be waiting. We need to be prepared at all times. But we also must look around. He gave us some signs. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Now we know that, don't we? How many of us have been looking at the flowers and stuff coming out and saying what? Spring is coming. <laughs> it's a sign, right? So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now you think that'd be easy, right? We'll just look at the signs and we'll see. The problem is all those signs like uh, wars, earthquakes, um, pandemics, disease, famine, people's love turning cold. How long has that been going on? Since he left. <laughs> What's his point? We should look around and not get scared by those things. This is what we had a message about this when we first started talking about the pandemic a year ago. I know it was a year ago when they started shutting it down, the pandemic. The pandemic we've just gone through was a sign. A sign that Jesus is coming. Maybe not right now, because we've had pandemics before. In fact, about every hundred years. But <laughs> we've had pandemics before, right? But each time that happens, each time there's an earthquake, each time there's a disaster, each time there's a famine, each time there's a pandemic, each time there's a war, what should we say? That means Jesus is still coming. Right? And that's what he's saying. Look around and know he's coming. The time is now. Keep at it. Be out there ministering to one another, spreading the gospel. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He will keep his promise, right? But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That means who also doesn't know? Jesus doesn't know. He's waiting too. Waiting for his father to say what? Go, gather my children. And that day is coming. He's being patient. We need to be patient. But in the meantime, we need to be about our father's business, don't we? And continue working. Looking at the signs, but letting those signs remind us that we have work to do. And preparing for him to come at any time, right? They're like little markers in time. It's still coming. It's still coming. Get back to work. Get back to work. 
Because frankly, if everything was fine, what would we do? Again, we just lay around eating bonbons. I don't know. We just kind of relax and oh, nothing bad's happening, so it must be okay. God must be happy. No. God's not happy, is he? And his wrath is coming. Let's so remember that. So, we should not be surprised like the world. We should look around us and realize Jesus is coming. The wrath of God is coming. We can see it every day, and the wrath of God is coming, isn't it? So, what should we do then? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. And this is one of those patterns in the Bible. I like patterns. I love patterns, as a matter of fact. Um, one of the patterns is whenever any writer in the Bible talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ, the very next words are, so what do you do in the meantime? Because <laughs> he knows us. That's our heart, right? Oh, Jesus is coming. Oh, that's great. I'll just wait for that. No. In the meantime, what should we be doing? And he says this, starting in verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Well, if it's going to be a while, I might as well take a nap, right? How many have ever done that? You know, it's been a long day. Church is at 6 o'clock. You know, I'll just uh, lay down here a little nap. And then you look up the clock, and what time is it? 7 o'clock. <laughs> 8 o'clock. In the morning, the next day. You just never know. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, is it? I didn't look at anybody when I said any of that, by the way. <laughs> just for those at home, they know I'm not putting on anybody. But, you know, let's, we're not supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be what? Working. we got work to do. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And that watch is be alert, like somebody who's standing on the wall looking for the enemy. Right? Except this time we're looking for our Savior. And we should be out there watching and sober, taking this seriously. How important is all this? This is a matter of not just life and death. This is a matter of eternal life and eternal death. Is this important? And we're doing it for who? Not just a king, not just a man, not just someone. Who are we doing this for? Our God and our king and our savior who loved us so much he died for us. This is how important this is. And we need to be watching and we need to be sober and we need to be what? Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And also what? Standing firm. And how can we stand firm? What does Ephesians tell us? We need to put on the armor of God, right? Because as we've been studying on Sunday morning, who's out there to get us? The devil's out there. He's slinging those things at us left and right and always attacking us. But does God give us the ability to stand firm? If we wear his armor, not our own, not by our strength or by our will, but we put on his armor, we are able to stand firm waiting for that day. In fact, let's look at a couple of verses. Keep something in 1 Thessalonians, but let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Again. Matthew 24, verse 42. After he says, learn the parable of the fig tree, be ready, see the signs, it is coming, it is coming, therefore you need to wait on the Lord, right? He says this in verse 42, watch therefore. For you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and could not have suffered his house to be broken up. This sounds like what he said in Luke, right? Therefore, be you also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made a ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find him so doing. How many want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? How many want to hear, you have done a great job, I appreciate your work? Who wants to be able to give him talents and investment on his investment in us to be able to hand those over to him and know we've done a good job? How many want to be ready? Remember when people used to go to work? Remember those days? People used to be in an office and stuff like that. When your boss would walk by the door, what did he expect you to be doing? 
working, right? Can't check anymore, so I don't know what you guys are doing. <laughs> but he expects you to find working. Who's our boss? God. He expects us to find us working. Whatever job he has for us. We all have different jobs, but we got jobs to do, don't we? And we need to be ready, watching for his coming. So that when he comes, he will find us working. He also wants us to be sober. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter, chapter four, verse seven. First Peter, chapter four, verse seven. But the end of all things is at hand. Now again, the timing of God is different than ours, right? It is still at hand. Be therefore sober. And watch into prayer. And above all these things have fervent charity, love amongst yourself. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom be praise and dominion forever and ever and everybody said amen right and his point here is you need to be so you need to take this you need to take your job seriously right because who are we working for <laughs> and when we do these things no matter how we minister if it's praying if it's giving if it's learning if it's teaching if it's going out and just giving an encouragement whatever god has for us to do if it's presenting the gospel being a missionary whatever god has for you we need to do it under the lord because it's that serious and who wants to be fired? I don't want to be fired. <laughs> right? My grandpa used to always say, you're leaving this, as a Christian, you're leaving this world one of two ways. Either being promoted, because you finished your job, and you're promoted home, like Paul and Peter and others, or fired because you're getting in the way. <laughs> I'd rather be promoted, how about you? Looking forward to that day. And he says, be sober. And again, in the other passage, he talks about reveling and getting involved in the world and being out and playing in this world. That's not where we should be, is it? We should take it seriously, our job as Christians, to be a light in this world and to minister to one another. And then standing firm, let's go to Romans chapter 13. I almost went to Ephesians, but, you know, everybody knows that one. <laughs> Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Especially I like the way this one starts. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. We don't know when, but we know it's sooner than it was. We're every day, every minute closer to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Put on his armor, put on him, right? And then we were able, as he says in Ephesians, able to stand against the wiles of the devil and do the job we're called to. This is a war, people. And we're going to win. Only because our faith is in the true victor, right? But we need to be watching. We need to be sober. We need to be standing firm in Jesus Christ, right? So he says, do those things. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Let's remember something. Again, the question often comes in our head, and this is one I, I like about uh, Paul's writing. He is such an excellent writer. I know, yes, it's God's, but his style. Because <laughs> the way Paul writes is he can hear the questions. <laughs> he can hear, because he's a human being, and he kind of is very self-aware. He knows if he starts talking about you need to stand firm, you need to watch, you need to do all those things, again, it's like, 
that's hard. That's hard. What? Why have we got to put all that effort in? Well, because we need to remember something. God has a plan, doesn't he? And he will fulfill that plan. In fact, look what he says next. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He has justified us, right? He has made us right. And in Romans chapter 8, he talks about the fact whom he has called, those he has, what? Justified. And those he's justified, he has sanctified. And those he's sanctified, he will what? Glorified, or has glorified. Always past tense. He's begun a good work in us, will complete it, won't he? All things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose, right? And he says here, listen, you need to remember, God has a plan in all this. Don't worry about it. Because if I'm reading this, I'm going, I can't do that. I don't have the strength to do that. I can't go through all that. No, no. Who's working in us? Who's going to complete his work in us? Who's the one that justified us? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who can stop the plan of God? Nobody. He's the one that is justified. He's the one that's made us right with him. He's the one that saved us. He is also the one that is what? Well, what? Let's keep going. 1 Thessalonians chapter... Five, verse 10, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, right? Whether we die or whether we're awake when he comes, we will be what? Glorified. We will be changed. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. The grave will be defeated. It has been defeated through the blood of Jesus Christ, hasn't it? We will be glorified. He's got a plan here, doesn't he? We are justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. We will be glorified, whether dead or alive at the time. <laughs> we will be glorified in his presence. And we will also be what? Unified. What does he say there? We should live together with him. And in fact, look at chapter 4, verse 17. Just go back in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4, verse 17. Just remember what he said already. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with him in the clouds. We call that the what? The rapture. To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Who? The dead in Christ and the alive in Christ will all be with him forever and ever and ever. Glorified, perfect, holy, never to sin again, no more sorrow, no more pain, forever and ever and ever. That's his promise, isn't it? So let's remember God's plan here. It's God that's going to accomplish these things. It's not under our power. It's not us for to do. We just need to basically come before God and say, use me, Lord. Help me to be watching. Help me to be sober and serious about this. Help me to stand firm. Use me, Lord, in accordance with your plan. And his plan is to save us. His plan is to glorify us. His plan is to unify us together with him forever and ever. That's a good plan. It's an excellent plan. Therefore, let's do what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Wherefore, given all this, comfort yourselves together. And again, remember who he's writing to. He's writing to some people under a tremendous amount of persecution. Young Christians who are scared. Young Christians have seen their members taken off to prison. Some of them have lost their jobs. Some of them have been thrown out of their families. They've been thrown out of the synagogue. They don't know where to turn. They have each other, and they have a love for one another, and they're praised for that. But still, it's kind of scary, isn't it, to live in such a world. But he says, it will be worth it all. God will hold up his end of the bargain, won't he? Therefore, comfort yourselves together. In fact, that's the same way he ended chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We will all rise. We will all be with him forever and ever. Let's take comfort from that. But also, what do we need to do? Verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Again, he has that. He loves these people. <laughs> And you're doing that. Keep at it. Keep building each other up. 
Keep encouraging because, let's face it, the devil ain't going to just give up. He's going to come attack. He's going to keep coming at us. He's going to keep spreading doubt. He's going to keep spreading all kinds of lies and deceptions. He's going to keep coming into our lives. And sometimes we're going to stumble. Sometimes we're going to fear. Sometimes we're going to question, aren't we? So who has God given to help each other? Each other. To come along beside each other and to build each other up and encourage one another in difficult times. And he says, as you're doing that, you, I know you do that, keep it up. We can't get through this without God, certainly. But also, it's hard to be successful without one another, too. We need to love one another, encourage one another, comfort one another with these truths. Jesus Christ is coming again, folks. We don't know when. The world will just assume he's never coming, never be held accountable for their sin, never be held accountable for what they've done, but they will be. Our job is to do what? Be ready and be working. Right? Get out there. Spread the gospel. Be a light. Make sure every day that God waits, people are coming to him. People are growing. Encourage one another. Comfort one another all on this path. And will it be worth it all in the end? We know it will. We'll be with him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.